You know what? You're here, which means you're passionate about making beer, whether it's home brewing or for a commercial brewery. Well, look no further, because today we're going to talk about the similarities, the differences, some tips, some tricks, some ways to save money, some ways to save time, but more importantly, understanding the equipment that goes into both commercial and home brewing. If you're a home brewer, this will teach you about commercial brewing. If you're a commercial brewer, this will teach you about how us home brewers make delicious beer. Now, I can make this video go on forever, but I'm not going to. <laughs> It's gonna be a concise video that covers a lot. See, this is me, CH, the last person you would ever wanna have at your wedding. And this is my heterosexual life partner, Maury. We've been friends for about seven years and we've brewed a ton of homebrew together. But he's also the head brewer at South Doe Brewing Company in Oceanside, California. Now, I'm not a commercial brewer, nor will I ever be. I'm a douchebag YouTuber, but I got a lot of buddies with breweries who all have different systems. And it is very interesting to me to see how their systems work at the commercial level. But at the end of the day, whether you're a commercial brewer or a home brewer, we both still need to worry about temperature control, transferring methods, sugar efficiencies, minimizing oxygen, and a bunch of other stuff. So with that, let's talk about temperature control. There's no topic more important than controlling your temperature to keep your yeast happy. Happy yeast means it's eating sugar and producing alcohol and CO2 in a desired time frame. There's a ton of different methods home brewers use for temperature control, but commercial brewers use glycol chillers. These are big, expensive generators that pump glycol through commercial fermenters. Think of glycol as food grade antifreeze. So if the inside of one of your fermenters cracks and it gets into your beer, your customers won't get sick and sue you. Then the glycol runs through these pipes up here on the ceiling and into each fermenter. See, commercial fermenters are jacketed, which means there's a gap within the stainless steel that lets glycol flow through the fermenter to keep it at a desired temperature. More often, they're on the roof because, yeah, they take up space, but more importantly, they're very loud. I have no clue what any of this stuff means. It reads like stereo instructions. But shout out to South, though, for letting me up on top of their roof. Now, you can buy scaled-down glycol chillers for homebrewing, but they're around $1,000 and it's just something I would never buy. Temp control is much too easy for home brewers. For starters, just find an ambient place in your house, maybe a closet, basement, cellar. One step up from that is finding a cheap or free fridge on Craigslist and connecting it to an inkbird. An inkbird will regulate the temperature control. Both home brewers and commercial brewers swear by inkbird. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's the best thing that I own. I've had the same one for seven years never had a problem with it and it's the most accurate thermometer out there for the price a calibrated thermometer is your number one tool in brewing if it's off everything is off strike water hot liquor tanks temp control sparge mash etc i used to use these recirculating systems with a water pump and a big chunk of ice with a cooler but just using an old fridge is a lot more convenient or don't listen to any of that and just use kvikis chill your wort to 115 degrees fahrenheit pitch your yeast kvikis produces delicious beer at a very high temperature yeast is an interesting one since I think it's very important these do not cross paths. You gotta keep home brewing a lot different. When I first got into brewing, I was reusing yeast. I thought it was cool and important to save $5 by harvesting and reusing. I soon found out I wasn't using these yeasts and they were just sitting in my fridge forever. It wasn't because I wasn't brewing. It was because I wanted to brew with yeast I hadn't tried before. When I started home brewing, White Labs had a ton of different liquid yeast and I wanted to try them all. And to me, that's kind of what home brewing is all about, experimenting. I never made the same batch of beer maybe more than three or four times, so why am I saving yeast? Going through all these extra steps and storing something I may never use again just to save five, seven dollars didn't make too much sense. All because you want to save a couple extra pennies. It doesn't get out. Especially when you have three homebrew stores in your city. I don't remember anything on Amazon at that time, back in 2014, 15. I mean, I get it. If you live in the cuts where it's difficult to get ingredients, then I'd have a different thought process. But commercial breweries have to reuse yeast. Yeast is way too expensive at that scale. A pitch of liquid yeast for a 10 barrel system can range anywhere from 250 to $500. Think of it kind of like clones for all those people who grow the devil's lettuce, the Mary J. Blige. And I've heard of commercial breweries who've used their initial yeast up to 15 times or generations. If yeast cost me hundreds of dollars, I probably never would have gotten into home brewing to begin with. And keep in mind, reusing yeast, it's not so much of a quality thing. Reusing yeast is all about saving money. The first three generations are the best quality, but then again, who knows? Different strains can be repitched for a different amount of times. The golden rule is from five to 10, but who knows? I'm a home brewer, I don't repitch. The racking game is also very different between home brewers and commercial brewers. And racking is just a fancy word for transferring, moving your wort or beer from one vessel to another. Commercial breweries have to use pumps. 
Even one barrel brew houses have pumps. A one barrel brew house, that's 31 gallons, which is about 250 pounds. Nobody wants to pick up 250 pounds, let alone of hot liquid. Commercial pumps range by horsepower. The more horsepower, the stronger the pump is. The stronger the pump is, the faster you could rack into a fermenter, a keg, or to a bottling line. Commercial pumps look like homebrew pumps, but they're on wheels with a handle. I used to use pumps as a homebrewer, but I have given up in recent years. If I can pick it up, then I just use mother gravity. Gravity is free and it works when the power goes out. A five gallon batch is gonna be about 40 to 45 pounds, depending on what fermenter you're using. And uh, as of recently, I pretty much just use plastic fermenter, so it's nothing. Pumps are great in theory, but I was always spilling wort, they were always breaking, and after the third time I got electrocuted, I just went to good old-fashioned manual circulation. One small pot, a little elbow grease, and a little bit more patient, and it's gonna work every time. When it comes to minimizing oxygen, commercial breweries definitely win. Their systems are just built for it. But there's methods for home brewers that can mimic what breweries do. The best way to minimize oxygen for home brewers is just to ferment under pressure. That means your fermenter has both gas and beer posts. You're also gonna need a spunning valve, which is a regulated pressure release valve. But if I'm making hazy IPA, I won't ferment under pressure because I know I'll drink the whole five gallon batch in 14 seconds. But if I'm brewing something that's really high in alcohol or it's a serious experimental batch and I'm worried it might sit in my keg grater for a while, I'll firm it in a corny keg under pressure. To do this, you need a jumper cable, which is a hose connected to two beer lines. I'll firm it in a corny keg and then I'll rack it into another corny keg that's gonna be my serving tank. See here, the CO2 tank to a corny keg that I fermented in, then it's gonna rack into another serving corny with a spunning valve set to no more than 15 PSI. Then I'll let it cold crash for a night and in the morning I'll disconnect the spunning valve connected to my keg grater, aka my draft system, and it's ready to drink all while reducing a ton of oxygen. Grain mashing is kind of self-explanatory. It's quite simple for a home brewer. You just mill your grain, dump it into your mash. Commercial breweries can do it this way, but then you're schlepping hundreds of pounds of grain in trash cans up to your mash tun. But the more common way for breweries to do it is just have your mill on the ground. It gets milled and then the auger transfers the grain through PVC tubing. Sure, it's a lot more expensive, but it saves you a ton of labor and a ton of liability. Last but not least is water chemistry, the redheaded stepchild of the beer making process. Commercial breweries have the advantage if they have water on demand. Having instant 170 degree water is amazing, but they just go off city water, sometimes well water. But breweries use carbon filters, which remove chlorine, lead, pesticides, and other stuff you wouldn't want in your beer. But the advantage definitely goes to home brewers. Breweries can't use bottled water. It would just be way too expensive. But on a five gallon scale, water's only a few bucks. In a perfect world, you'd want to use distilled water every time and then make your adjustments with your beer salts so you knew exactly what was in your water. Distilled water is purified water, but it's had all of its minerals removed. But in all honesty, I only use distilled water when I'm making hard seltzers. More often than not, I'm just using bottled water or even water from this local machine. Here is the 10 second elevator speech. If the water tastes great to drink, then it's gonna taste great in beer. All right, thanks for letting me waste your time. Obviously, there's a ton of other stuff we didn't cover, but that's what the live stream is for. Click the link in the bio. We're probably over there right now. Whether you're a commercial brewer or a home brewer, the bottom line is the same. We're trying to make great beer. There's a million different methods on everything, but however you make great beer is however you make great beer. Nobody cares if you spent $50,000 at beer college or if you brew with extract. You talk to 10 different brewers, you're gonna get 10 different answers. But thank you for watching this week's video. Cheers to eating good and cheers to drinking good.